morning and welcome to the Midwest Technical Inspections Virtual Seminars. My name is Doug Bennett. I'm one of the Quality Assurance and Training Managers here at MTI. This morning's session is the Commercial Lines Inspections 101. Uh, this is actually part one of a two-part series that we have. So uh, this series is meant to, to cover the basic of property and liability inspections. So we're kind of following along with our standard uh, MPS form, which is just our bread and butter. That's the most common form that we have where we cover both property and liability. So this morning's session, we'll be covering mostly the, the property portion of that, that presentation. And then on Thursday in part two, we'll get into the liability and some of the operational exposures, the unique things that are specific to the different occupancies that we might run across. But this morning, we'll be talking uh, primarily about property. We'll look at fire protection, we'll look at class construction, uh, we'll look at some other roof deficiencies, and then we'll look at the common hazards, so the HVAC, the electrical, and so on. So we'll go ahead and get started here. If at any time you have a question, we do have a chat function built into the GoToMeeting. You can feel free to insert that into your chat at any time, and then I'll address your question as soon as I have the opportunity. Uh, but otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. So like I said, we're gonna be kind of following along with the property and liability form, the multi peril survey. Uh, so that's kind of why we're in the, the format or the, the order that we're in. And so we'll kind of follow along with that form. So as we're doing the, the form, the very first section is the general information section. And this is that kind of generic information uh, where this is just letting us know what it is we're dealing with, who is the insured, and what do they do. So it's got some of that generic information, like when did you go out and do this inspection? Uh, was there any kind of special attention or idiosyncrasies information that you, you needed to develop? Because if we've taken the time to develop that information from our client, you know, this is stuff that's extremely important to them that they've taken the time to specifically point it out. We wanna make sure that we're addressing that right away at the very top of our report. So that's right there. The, it's like the second or third question on the form. Uh, then we talk about who we interviewed, what kind of contact information we have for them, what kind of occupancy is this, how long have they been in business, how long have they been at this location, what are the hours of operation, all that just really generic information that just gives us kind of a picture of who it is that we're dealing with in this particular uh, risk. Then we get to the description of operations. And the description of operations is the single most important part of every single commercial inspection that we complete. This is where we really paint the picture of who the insured is and what they do. You know, a, an underwriter should be able to take a look at our report and, and look at the description of operations. And after reading that, they should be able to uh, have a very good idea of who the insured is and what they do. They should have an idea of what kind of exposures they're going to have and uh, you know what kind of risk levels they're going to have just based on that description of operations. So as you're writing this, you're really going to want to focus in on what does the insured actually do. You know, be specific, go into the details of what they do, including any products that they make or any services that they offer. You know, what, what are all their operations? And so then we're also looking at how do they actually perform those business functions. So we want to describe the entire process from beginning to end. So from the time that raw material first arrives at the location, what all does it have to go through before it leaves in the finished product? You know, give us the full scope of their business. And then, uh, of course, where are these functions performed? So that's where you're going to actually describe the facilities a little bit. So a lot of our inspectors get into a, a bad habit of spending the entire description of operations describing the building. The, that is actually just a, a minor point to our description of operations. And it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with what they do. That's just where they are doing that. And so we don't need to describe necessarily the, the construction of the building or anything like that. We just want to say, okay, yes, they have um, a section here for manufacturing, they have a section here for you know, offices or administrative positions. They have a section here for sh uh, packaging and shipping. You know, that's that's more what we're talking about when we say describe the, the facilities, not necessarily, well, it was concrete block with a steel bar joist roof. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We want to know, like, what types of operations or functions are being performed in this facility, and are they isolated from each other? Are they all kind of intertwined, intertwined and mingled together? You know, that's what we're talking about when we say describe the facilities. 
And of course, we can't forget any kind of offsite operations. You know, a lot of businesses do have exposure offsite. So maybe they're doing some kind of sales or service or repair or installation on a, on a job site away from this particular risk. And so we need to know what those exposures are because that's a big part of their business. It's actually one of the higher risk areas. So we want to make sure we're looking at uh, those as well and identifying what kind of exposure they have. There are some guides out there or some tools to help you with this process. Um, one of the, the tools that we recommend is the best underwriting guide. Now, the best underwriting guide is this gigantic conglomerate of, of information that has been gathered together about pretty much any occupancy you can think of. And it really walks you through an inspection process where it talks about what, what is this type of risk and helps you identify what types of things are likely to be happening there, what types of things you should be looking for for property coverage, what types of things you should be looking for for liability, for work comp, or you know, depending on what coverage you're, you're actually inspecting, they'll have kind of suggestions for you on what things to look for. So this is a tool that we can uh, definitely utilize for some of those more uh, unique or complex risks that you're not necessarily used to. And uh, it's not something that we can send out to everybody. We can't send you the entire best underwriting guide. It's just there's licensing problems with that. There's it's just size problems with that. You know, having it making it available to everybody would be very difficult for us. So, but if it's something that you come across a risk that you're just not comfortable with and you want you want to prepare a little bit better, you can ask us and we can see if we can give you the section of the best underwriting guide that applies to to your particular risk. But there are tools out there that can help you. Uh, you can always contact our office anytime that you are feeling kind of overwhelmed or just need a little bit more guidance. Uh, we can always help you in what direction to go and what to focus on. So the next section in the report then is the fire protection. So uh, anytime we're dealing with the property of a, a building, we wanna look at how are we going to protect that property? How are we gonna protect that building? And fire is one of the biggest concerns that we have, so we're looking at fire protection. Now, every fire extinguisher manufacturer has a certain size of fire that it was designed to fight and a certain type of fire that it was designed to fight. And so on the fire extinguisher itself, there is a classification code. And that tells you what type of fire and what size of fire that one was designed to fight. So it's a combination of numbers and letters in the classification that tells you the size and the type. But this is just a little uh, kind of graph here that shows you the different types of fires that we have here. You know, the most common that we have is the ordinary combustibles. So the letter A, the B is in for the flammable gases, C is for your file, fires involving electrical equipment. Class D is something that we very rarely see. This would be for your combustible metals. So this would be some kind of specialized uh, manufacturing or uh, kind of laboratory type setting where they have a very unique, a combustible metal. That, like if you put water on this metal, then it's going to actually erupt into flame. So it's something that is very, very unique. And then class K is a very uh, common one that we see and so a lot newer. This is for those uh, commercial kitchens where we have grease vapor and we want to make sure we're not just uh, throwing water onto a grease vapor fire. But on the label itself, there, there should be a U UL uh, symbol, underwriter's laboratory symbol, and then just below that, you will see the little classification there for uh, what size and type of fire. So here we see like a 1A 10BC fire extinguisher. So that means for all A type fires, we have the equivalency of one gallon or 1.5 gallons of water. And for the B and C type fire extinguishers, we can have the equivalency of uh, 10 square footage. So it will cover 10 square feet of uh, area for those types of fires. So this is a relatively small fire extinguisher. This is what you might see if you were to go to like a Home Depot or Lowe's or uh, Menards or something like that and buy one for your home, for like your kitchen. Uh, this is a single use type of fire extinguisher. And this is not considered acceptable for commercial lines. So if you are doing a commercial inspection and you see this small single use 1A 10BC fire extinguisher, then you know that that is not acceptable and they're actually gonna to need to upgrade to a commercial grade fire extinguisher. So 
uh, you know, when we get into all these different sizes and everything, that you know, obviously there's going to be some uh, some issues there of when it's required, what size is required. But for our basic standpoint, just know that this 1A10BC fire extinguisher is not acceptable for commercial lines. We need something bigger like a 2A10BC, a 2A40BC, a 4A80BC, something along those uh, lines. But 1A10 is not considered acceptable. But with all fire extinguishers for commercial lines, we do need to make sure that they are being serviced on an annual basis. So inside of these fire extinguishers, there's a mixture of chemicals. And uh, we really need those chemicals to be kind of, the, to stay in the right consistency, to stay uh, mixed up and, and, and pressurized so that if you go to use them, they're gonna spray out and, and spray out evenly onto the fire. What can happen though, is over time, those chemicals will kind of settle and they'll kind of rest at the bottom and they'll actually can solidify at the bottom. And then if you go to use the fire extinguisher, it's not going to spray out the chemical because it's all solidified at the bottom of the tank. So we wanna make sure that they're getting in there and servicing these fire extinguishers on an annual basis. And when they do that servicing, they'll go in there and they'll agitate those chemicals, mix them up, make sure that it's all suspended, make sure that the pressure is, is adequate so that it can expel those chemicals when needed. Uh, they'll just make sure that the tank is, is in good condition and so on. And then roughly every six to eight years, they'll actually take and they'll remove the chemicals out of the tank and they'll put new chemicals in. And just again, to make sure that those chemicals are going to operate when they actually are needed. So it's extremely important that we get that annual servicing. This is probably the single most common recommendation that we make on our commercialized reports is to have the annual servicing. So every fire extinguisher that you look at should have a service tag on it. It tells you who did the servicing and it'll tell you when it was last done. So you know you have one year from that to get this thing serviced again. So you can always see, it's usually really easy to identify. Okay, I got the great, great big year of service on there. And then down here I have punched out that, okay, this one was done in March of 2008. So obviously if I was looking at this one today, it's well past due for its servicing, but if I was looking at that one in say 2008, 2009, then it would have been right on, on target for when we were trying to do this. But you always wanna make sure you're looking at that. Uh, I highly recommend taking uh, a close up photo like this photo right here of one of the service tags of while you're in that property. It really helps to validate your report and just show the underwriter exactly what you saw. Um, we don't need that photo of every single fire extinguisher or anything like that, but it just helps you and your report to show, yes, they do have a fire extinguisher, yes, it was serviced, and this is when it was serviced. So just get that one close-up photo of the tag just to show that. Again, the minimum size for commercial lines would be a 2A10BC fire extinguisher. So you wanna make sure that you're looking at that classification on at least one of those fire extinguishers you know, those 1A10 ones, those are pretty, really small and they usually stand out pretty well. Uh, the 1A10BC is not serviceable. They, they just can't get in there and it's too small for them to service. So that's why it's not acceptable for commercial lines. And then if they do have commercial grease vapor cooking, we do need to see the K-class fire extinguisher. Now the K-class fire extinguisher, um, the, one of the good things about this is they do color code the fire extinguishers. So as you're looking around, so the, the A, class A, just for the ordinary combustible fires, it's usually gonna be either a silver or a white. More often I've seen white with like a blue lettering, um, but it is something you can pretty easily identify. And you see like the little nozzle on it, it's nice and small, it's definitely a liquid nozzle, basically just pressurized water. The most common extinguisher that we see is the, the multi-purpose or the class ABC. And that's where it's that bright red. It's got a little bit bigger nozzle on it because it is a, a chemical that they're gonna be spraying out for that multi-purpose type of fire. The, the class C, so this is just for electrical fires. This is going to be like a carbon dioxide powder type of, of application. And it's going to have that big horn on the end of it for dispersal of that powder. And it's gonna be a darker red. The class D for that uh, specialty, you know, the flammable or combustible metals, um, that's going to be that bright yellow. It's really going to stand out saying, hey, this is unique. This is different. And then the class K for the commercial cooking, those are going to be the like shorter, fatter chrome 
uh, ones with a, again with a liquid nozzle on here. So these are meant to go in commercial kitchens. Now the chemicals inside of this fire extinguisher are going to supplement the automated uh, extinguishing system, so the AES system. They're going to complement that and it helps to put out that fire uh, when it's a, a, a grease fire. The problem with grease fires is it's a very flammable material that is also very hot, so it really tends to kind of reignite after, even after you put it out initially. So we need to have that extra protection of the K class. You don't want to have your standard you know, A or class ABC type of fire extinguisher inside that kitchen because those will act like throwing water onto that grease fire and can cause it to flare up and erupt into the person's face. So we do not want to see these types of fire extinguishers inside of that commercial kitchen. We want to see just the K class, the chrome uh, ones for that purpose. So the, the fire extinguisher is your first source of defense. So that's where the person can actually get involved in the, the fire protection itself. But sometimes the next level or the, the little bit more expensive upgrade here would be the actually sprinkler system. So when we talk about a sprinkler system, there's all kinds of uh, details that we could provide. Uh, but if you've looked at our multi peril survey, you'll know that we actually uh, have two different levels. I'm going to go ahead and pull over to a form real quick. Let's pull that up so we can see what I'm talking about here. When I get down to that fire protection section and I get to the sprinklers, you can see that I, I start the sprinkler questions right here and I have a couple of questions. And then I get to this point here where it says, complete when requested in videos or, or special instructions. So we have you know, this long section here of specialized questions about the sprinkler. So this is like extra level of detail on sprinkler systems, but you are only to fill these out when this section is actually requested in the special instructions or idiosyncrasies. Uh, most of the time, we are not going to do any of these extra details of questions. Um, this is only for those unique clients that really have specialized rating depending on the sprinkler uh, characteristics. So we have to go into those extra levels so they can properly rate their, their risk. But normally speaking, you would just leave these questions blank and only answer these first couple of questions about the sprinklers. So that basic information though, we have, uh, first and foremost, we need to identify what type of sprinkler system do we have? Do we have a wet system or do we have a dry system? Now, it, a, lot of, a lot of our people will think that, oh, well, a dry system must be some sort of chemical. Uh, that they're dumping out onto the fire, but that's not what we mean by dry system. So both a wet system and a dry system use water. The difference between a wet system and a dry system is whether or not the water is in the pipes uh, waiting to be dispersed. So in a wet system, water is constantly inside of the pipes at the, the sprinkler heads ready to go. So as soon as that sprinkler head is tripped, the water starts flowing out. Whereas a dry system actually has air inside those pipes. So the air is holding the water back. So the water is you know, stopped right about here. And then there's air in all of these pipes going out to the different branches of the building. And so at the sprinkler head, if it is tripped, then all of that air pressure has to be released. Then the water can flow through the pipes to that sprinkler head, and then it will spray out. So there's a delay in the response for a dry system. So that kind of it makes you kind of wonder, okay, well, why would I ever want to have a dry system if there's going to be a delay in the response? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, you may have like a, a sensitive uh, location, like there might be sensitive equipment there. For example, you might have a lot of computer equipment, server room, things like that, where if you had a leak from your pipes, that could actually cause a lot of problems. Uh, where it, it could actually damage or ruin the equipment. So we want to make sure that they don't have uh, any water that could possibly be dripping down. There. Another possible reason would be if you have um, if you have like a, a extreme climate control. So maybe if you have something like the, like the walk-in freezer type of situation where the entire room is kept at an extremely cold temperature. Uh, so you, you wouldn't want to have your pipes freezing. 
or the other option or the other reason might be is if you have no climate control so if you live in a cold climate and you don't have heat in that area well then you obviously don't want to have water in the pipes that could possibly freeze and burst so those are the, the main reasons that you would have a dry system it's just really trying to protect the pipes from from freezing and then also put to, protect the equipment below them from any potential leaks. But how do you, as the inspector, determine whether or not you have a wet system or a dry system? Well, you can do that by looking at the main sprinkler riser. So when you come into the, to the risk, you wanna to go to the sprinkler riser room. And this is where the water is actually coming in from the city or the municipality and then being dispersed out to the various branches of the building. So at this main control here, where you have the you know, valve to turn the water on and off, you will see a pressure gauge here. If you see one pressure gauge, that's telling you that's the pressure of the water that's coming into the system and out to the various branches of the system. If you see a second pressure gauge here, that's the one that's telling you the, the pressure of the air that's going into those pipes to hold all that water back. So a single pressure gauge tells you it's a wet system, and then two pressure gauges tells you that it's a dry system. So that's going to be one of the, the important things to look at and identify. Sometimes you're going to have multiple uh, systems coming in here. So you may have this, this riser here, and then over here you might have a second riser, and then a third riser. Depending on the size of the facility, uh, you may have multiple risers like that. And so you need to look at each one of those risers individually to see you may actually have a combination where part of the building has a wet system and part of the building has a, a dry system. You know, maybe there's a, a loading dock that uh, gets really cold so they have a dry system for that portion of the structure but then the main warehouse where it is climate controlled maybe they have a wet system there for the faster response so you do need to look at all of them and we do highly recommend that you take a good photo of the actual whole riser system like this so that you can see in the so the viewer can see and so the underwriter can see what you saw and kind of see for themselves the different setups you know they can see the valve they can see the, the alarm systems down here. They can see the pressure valves. So we can get an idea of what we're dealing with uh, just from your photos and kind of help support your report. <laughs> the second thing that we want to look for when we're at the location is we need to look for this box that should be on the wall and it should have these spare sprinkler heads involved <clears throat> inside of it. And there should be a little wrench in there as well. This is extremely important because uh, the way that the sprinkler heads work. Now, Hollywood has really ruined a lot of people on sprinklers. They think, okay, you know, I'm being chased by a bad guy. I'm gonna hold my lighter up to the sprinkler head and it's gonna set off all of the sprinklers in the entire building and I'll be able to escape through a cloud of, of rain. That's not the way that this works. Most of these sprinkler heads are going to be zonal. So like they're, each one of them is going to uh, set off just that one sprinkler. So they usually have like this little glass vial that has like a, a gas inside of it. And that gas is sensitive to temperature. So as it, once it gets to a certain temperature, that gas is going to expand to the point that it's actually going to rupture that little glass vial that, that's holding the gas. Well, that little glass vial is what's holding the water back. So if, if the fire gets hot enough to rupture the glass valve, then it, all of a sudden the water is allowed to escape through through that sprinkler head and spray out onto the fire right below it. So only the sprinkler heads that are close enough to the fire to reach that temperature are going to erupt and are going to spray the water out. You know, you're not gonna have every sprinkler head in the entire building going off, just the ones close to the fire. Now, that's great while you have a fire, but once that fire is put out, you no longer have a way to stop that water. The glass vial has, has ruptured and blown apart. There's no way to just kind of push it back into place. So it's important that we have these spare heads here so that they can go in there, they can grab one that has the glass vial intact, grab the wrench, and go back out there and they can replace the, the damaged sprinkler head with the one that's intact. So now they can turn the water back on and they can protect the building again. So it just really shortens the amount of time that they have to turn the water off uh, just, just long enough to re replace that sprinkler head and then they, they are back in service. So it's that's one of the things that we need to make sure that we're looking for. If we don't see this box on the wall, then that's definitely gonna be something that we're gonna be making a recommendation for. Otherwise, we're gonna be looking for, like here we have an alarm system on the wall, so we're gonna identify that this is a central uh, reporting alarm system. 
where it may be going off to an actual alarm company like an ADT, or it may be going directly to the fire department, or uh, it's going somewhere to alert that the alarm has been sounded. Now, how that gets triggered, there's a couple of different ways that it could be done. Uh, we have some type, types of alarms have what they call a tamper alarm. Like this one right here, you can see there's a little box right next to the valve here with a wire that then goes off to the alarm system. So basically what happens here is right now the, the valve is turned so it's in the, the on position. If somebody starts to turn that valve and it starts to turn the water off, then it will sound the alarm saying, hey, somebody's messing with the water. If they're turning the water off, go check it out. Why are they turning it off? Otherwise, you might see something like this one where it's a flow alarm. So this, obviously, you won't be able to see this from the exterior because you know here we had to go in and we had to take this cover plate off, which you obviously are not going to be doing. Uh, but you can see inside there that there's a little damper in there. And normally that damper would be in a closed position. That means that the water is stagnant and not doing anything. But then if there's a leak or if there's a pressure change or the water starts to flow, it'll push that damper into the open position and that will trigger the alarm and saying, hey, there, there's water flowing through the system for some reason, so you need to check this out. Is there a leak? Is there an act, active sprinkler head? You know, what's going on? Why is the water flowing? So those are the types of things that we need to look for. And again, that's where taking that overall photo of the sprinkler riser will really help you out because we can see a lot from just this one little photo here. The second photo that you should be taking is the uh, pipe design. So this placard should be on the uh, pipe, on the main pipe coming off of the, the sprinkler riser there. Uh, or in this instance, you can see it's just kind of hanging off of there, but normally they're actually attached directly to the, the pipe itself. But this is going to be an important photo for you. When you see this hydraulic system design placard, you want to get a close-up photo of that placard. This photo right here will actually give us all the details that we need from that second section, that more advanced section of the, the, BB, of the uh, MPS there for the sprinkler systems. This is all those design elements that we would need for that section. So by providing this, even though we haven't answered those questions, we're, we're providing that same level of information. So this is a great photo for you to take. Make sure that when you're taking this photo, it's actually legible. Sometimes when you get into these like kind of darker rooms and uh, there might be a shine on it or you get a little bit blurry because it's a little bit darker, you had to move a little bit. So just make sure that before you attach it, that it's a legible photo that we can actually read what those those numbers are but anytime you see that placard take a photo of it all these types of fire protection uh, here we see what is called an enunciator panel so an enunciator panel is uh, something that's really designed for more of your larger like multi-story types of buildings where you have a, a fire alarm system and this is actually a way of alerting the fire department where within the building the alarm has been sounded. So if you have just like a, a regular uh, one story wide open structure and you walk in, well, it's pretty obvious where the fire is. You look at, oh, there's the glow, there's the smoke over there, let's go over there. But if you go into like a multi-story building or a building that has been really uh, sectioned off, then it may not be obvious where the fire is. And so you don't want to waste time wandering through the building trying to find the fire. You want the fire department to be able to go directly to the source of the alarm. So what this does is this is at the, uh, the emergency entrance. So the fire department, anytime a building is built, they go, they establish uh, at the occupancy uh, meeting when the inspection, when they're going around to make sure that this is something that can be occupied, they will set up an emergency entrance and they'll have a special key that they can access the property from that that entrance and then if there's an alarm system or an enunciator panel like this they'll put this at that emergency entrance and what we have here is we actually have a map of the, the building below it and then we have this little panel up here that tells where within this building that alarm sounds so it'll say oh the alarm is going off in zone c you look down here oh zone c is right here okay let's go straight over to that part right to where the alarm has been sounded. So it's just a, a faster way of getting to the actual point of problem.
This is not something that is required uh, by NFPA uh, Life Safety Code, but this is something that it's always a bonus if they have this. So we want to make sure that we're identifying that they have it uh, so that the under, underwriter can take that into consideration. We always want to see if they have any kind of smoke or heat detectors, uh, so any kind of alert system to alert, especially the people within the building that the fire, that there's a fire or potential fire, so that they have a chance to get out of the structure. So you, if you see the smoke or heat detectors, you want to get a photo of that just to show, yes, they have it, and to help us to identify whether it is a smoke detector or if it is a heat detector. And then any other kind of fire alarm systems that they might have, like this is the audible flasher. So this is just a way of alerting the people within the structure that the fire alarm has been sounded. So it'll emit a really loud and noxious noise, but it also will flash a strobe. So even if you uh, are deaf and cannot hear, you still have an alert that, hey, the alarm has been sounded. So that its only purpose is on-site local alarm to let the people in the building know that the alarm has been sounded. The manual pull, this is going to be a way for the individual to set off the fire alarm. So, you know, let's say you're sitting in your cubicle playing with matches and you catch your garbage can on fire. Well, you could go then and you could pull this alarm and alert everybody else in the building that you're trying to kill them. So it, it, it sets off the alarm before the fire gets big enough to set off the alarm on its own through the heat detector or smoke detector or anything like that. So it's just a way to, to manually set off that alarm system. So that's it for our, our fire protection. So again, it's really looking at how do we protect that building from fire? So we're, we're expecting that if there's a fire, how can we stop that fire or limit the amount of damage caused by that fire? Next, we're gonna look at the premises, which is really the section that talks about the actual structure itself and how that structure is built. One of the most important things that we can do for uh, premises is to identify the class of construction. So the ISO class of construction is a, a rating system that talks about the combustibility of a structure. So uh, this goes from class one, which is the most combustible structure, to a class six, which is the least combustible structure. So this is a, a national standard that we have uh, for combustibility of a structure based on the, the construction type. And so it really helps the underwriters know if there's a fire in this structure, what's the likelihood that it's going to uh, spread throughout the building? You know, what's the likelihood of it to be a total loss type of thing? So you know, how, how much damage is going to be caused if there is a fire inside the structure? To, to classify the class construction, we really need to know two things. We need to know what are the structural walls made of? So not all of the, like the interior division walls, you know, the, you know, the little walls that separate our offices into different offices, but what are the actual structural walls made of? So that's typically going to be the exterior walls and you know, that are actually holding this building up. What are they made of? And then also what is the roof deck and supports made of? So what's holding that roof system up? What is it made of? Once we've identified these two components, well, then we should be able to identify the class construction of the structure. So the first class that we have is class one, which is wood frame. And when we're talking about wood frame, this is the, the most combustible structure that we have, but this is also the, probably the most common type of construction that we have in the United States. So this is where the walls are made of wood or some other combustible material, and the roof is also made of wood or other combustible material. So it's gonna be that kind of stick built system that we see all over the United States. So you have the wood stud walls, you have the wood, uh, the rafters or, or the wood joists for uh, or wood truss for the roof system. So everything is wood. So the walls are wood, the roof is wood. Uh, so it's all combustible. If there's a fire, the fire is going to spread rapidly through that structure and it's going to actually uh, fail and collapse a lot faster than most materials. So this is the single most common type of construction we have in the United States, but it's also the most combustible construction that we have in the United States. When we're looking at this though, we do want to make sure we're looking at the structural components. We don't want to be fooled by a facade or by the, the finished material. 
So an example of this is brick veneer. So when we see a brick veneer wall, which is a more modern construction, uh, definitely like post-1960 type of construction, uh, where you actually have a wood stud wall that's holding the structure up, and then they throw a layer of bricks across the front of that for aesthetic purposes. So we need to be able to identify that this is a, a actually a class one, even though we see brick, it's a class one structure because the structural support of that wall is in the studs behind that layer of brick. You know, if there's a fire, it's going to sp spread rapidly through that wall, through the, the wood studs, and it's going to cause them to collapse and fail and the building may collapse, you may have a facade of brick still standing, but the rest of the building has collapsed because all the, the structural support was that combustible wood material. We also uh, may see it as simple as this, a, a pole frame type of structure where you have these large wooden beams that are spread farther apart. So, you know, wood studs are gonna be like 16 inches. Well, these posts are gonna be more like eight feet apart. And there are going to be a lot fewer of them, but they're a lot bigger, thicker, uh, and it's a very simplistic structure. But if you have a fire, those wood beams are going to burn just like the wood studs would. So it's still considered that class one or wood frame structure. Class two then is called joisted masonry. And with a joisted masonry system, now we have a wall that is made of some sort of masonry material. It could be a concrete block, it could be solid brick, it could be poured concrete, it could be stone. It really doesn't matter. It's just the fact is that the structural walls are made of masonry material. There's no wood in those. But the, the roof is still made of wood or other combustible. So you can see that this structure is not going to burn as readily as the class one because now the walls are, are non-combustible. They're not going to burn, but the roof is still very vulnerable and it can still burn and there's still gonna be a huge loss and major damage if there's fire gets into that roof system. This is a very common construction that we see, especially in like a smaller, like downtown areas. Uh, you'll see where you'll have some sort of masonry wall, common to have like a brick covering on top of a concrete block or solid brick uh, walls. And then you have the standard, maybe a flat joisted wood roof, but it, or maybe the truss roof. You know, when you look at it, you see the masonry walls, but you see asphalt shingles on the roof, that's going to tell you that you have that wood system on the roof. So we know that then that's that class two construction. So that really gets us into how we determine whether this is a brick veneer wall or if this is a solid brick wall. So there's a couple of factors to keep in mind with this. First of all, the brick veneer is typically an accent piece. It's like an aesthetic thing. So uh, anytime that you see just part of the wall is brick that tells you right there that's a brick veneer it's very difficult to take a solid brick wall and mix it and intertwine it with uh, a frame wall so if if you see like part of the wall is brick just like a maybe like a lower portion or just an accent piece well then that tells you it's brick veneer if you see that the entire wall all four walls all of it is brick well then that's a greater chance that it's a solid brick because uh, there's no intermixing of, of construction class in there. Another thing to look for is when you have a solid brick wall, you actually have two rows of bricks running parallel to each other. There's usually a little bit of an air gap or space between the two rows of bricks uh, for insulation purposes. Uh, but if you take those two rows of bricks, you just keep stacking them higher and higher. The higher you go, the more unstable those two rows of bricks become. So what they actually do is every six to eight rows, they'll take a brick and they'll actually turn it sideways. And then it'll lay it across the two rows of bricks to tie those two rows, two rows together and to provide some stability to those two rows of bricks. Uh, so what happens then is when you're looking at the outside of the wall, every six to eight rows, you will see that we have this header row here where you see the skinny end of the brick. Then you see fat end, fat end, fat end, fat end, fat end, fat end, skinny row, skinny end. So every six to eight rows, you see that header row where they've turned the brick sideways to stabilize and tie those bricks together. Uh, you can also look at the age of the structure. So brick veneer is a pretty modern uh, technique. It really took, takes place after 1960. So if your structure was built before 1960 uh, and you see that all of the walls are, are brick like this, then you know, okay, that's going to be that solid brick. Uh, it just it's, it's 
too old of a construction for that brick veneer. One thing that you might see though, is you might see that they actually have a change in the type of brick for a, a solid brick wall. Uh, so you can imagine if you have two rows of bricks for the entirety of the wall, all the way around the structure, that's a lot of bricks and a lot of money. So sometimes what they will do is they'll actually try to save money by changing the type of brick for the sides and the back of the structure. So you look at the front of the structure, it's got that nice, clean, dark looking brick. Uh, that's what they would call a face brick, or it's a, a higher quality, a uh, more expensive type of brick for the front facade of this, this structure where you can, the part that you're actually going to see. But then if you go around to the sides and to the rear of the structure, you'll see that it's a less uniform color. It's a, not as dark of a color. It's not as nice of a brick. It's just a, a cheaper version of the brick. So it's a common brick. Uh, so they use different different types of bricks, the much cheaper brick on the sides and on the rear where people are less likely to see it. And they say the, the, the fancy expensive bricks for the front where people are likely to see the structure. So if you see that kind of change in the type of brick, that's a huge indicator that that's a, a solid brick wall that you would need to, you would consider that then a masonry wall. And then if the roof is, is uh, wood, then that's that class two construction. Class three then is our non-combustible. So with a non-combustible construction, the walls are gonna be made of unprotected steel or some other non-combustible material. And the roof is gonna be made of unprotected steel or non-combustible material. So again, this, this one's a little bit less combustible because now the roof's not going to burn as readily as it does with that, that wood roof. This is extremely common in our manufacturing, warehousing, uh, this is an extremely uh, inexpensive way to to build a big open space. So that's why it's so common in manufacturing, warehousing, and those kind of industrial types of trades. So what we'll see is actually like a steel skeleton for the structure. So you have like these steel girts that go you know, up the walls, across the roof, and down the other side, and down that wall. And you know, it's just this steel skeleton, and that steel skeleton can be wrapped in pretty much anything that you want. So most of what most time when we see it'll be like a, a corrugated metal siding, corrugated steel. Uh, so it's, it's just that generic cheap metal siding that does all it does is protect things from getting in. It's not fancy, it doesn't look great, but it really could be anything. They could put brick facade on the front of it. You know, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is the structural support is in that steel skeleton. Most of the time, this is a really easy one to identify because most of the time it's a very basic construction that has minimal finishes to it. So you walk in and I'll, you look up, there you go, there's your steel girts there. There You can see those big beams going across the roof. You can see the beams holding up the walls. So most of the time it's really easy to identify uh, because of the minimal finishes inside. Sometimes though, they'll throw you a curveball like this bottom picture here. Right now, we see the steel skeleton here. So this is the structural support of this building. What we don't see is that a couple of weeks from now, they're gonna come in with these concrete panels and they're gonna hang those concrete panels off of those, the steel skeleton here. So when we, when this construction is complete, it's gonna look like uh, they have masonry walls, but those concrete panels are not supporting anything. They're hanging off of this skeleton. All the structural support of this building is in this steel skeleton. So it would still be considered a class three non-combustible structure. But again, most of the time it's pretty easy. Like this one, we can see from outside even, we can see those steel girts going up the walls and across the roof. Uh, other indicators that we might see from the outside, uh, if you look at the pitch of the roof, a wood joist or wood truss roof is typically gonna have a, a steeper pitch to it because the wood trusses can't hold as much weight as a steel truss. So uh, they typically will have a greater pitch for more watershed, more snowshed, things like that. Uh, so those steel girt roofs, they tend to be really low pitch. Uh, we'll also, we'll see with a wood truss system, they're gonna have a cantilever where the, the roof is gonna actually extend out beyond the wall a little bit, and you'll see an ease or a soffit here. With a steel roof, it's gonna end right at the edge of the wall and go straight down. There's not gonna be that, that ease or soffit with a steel system. 
class four. Now we have the masonry non-combustible. So this is like a combination of the, the classes so far. So the walls are gonna be made of some sort of masonry material. Again, it can be any one of those masonry materials, it doesn't matter. But the roof now is going to be made of steel or non-combustible. So this is less combustible than that class two because the roof is now a non-combustible material as well. This tends to be a little bit more modern construction, uh, like in your more modern downtown offices, retail operations, things like that. Uh, we see where we have the masonry walls. Uh, a lot of times it'll be concrete block or a brick on top of a concrete block uh, system. And then you have the steel bar joists or uh, steel beams supporting a steel decking on the roof system. When we're doing these inspections, you really wanna try and find some sort of unfinished area. So look for like a utility room or a sprinkler room or something like that where you can get in there and you can see the raw elements of this construction. If you have like drywall everywhere, well then it makes it really difficult to see what the construction is. Uh, so you wanna try and find one of those unfinished rooms where you can look up and you can see, okay, there's my steel bar joists, my steel decking. I see the concrete walls there. I know then that this is a class four construction. Um, it, if you cannot get a hold of or cannot find this anywhere, uh, there's no unfinished areas, uh, you may need to ask a few questions of the insurer to ask about how it was constructed. You know, obviously we would love to see every one of these structures being built like this one here so we could easily see, oh, this concrete block, steel bar joists, clear, clear cut class four. But that's just not the way it works. We're going in post construction. So everything's, it may be finished off and you may not have access to those things. So you may have to take a few clues uh, from what you can see. You may have to look at like the, the depth of the window jams or the depth of the door jams. Say, okay, does that look like it's a you know three and a half inch wood stud behind that? Or does that look like it's a you know six inch concrete block behind that drywall? You, know, you look at the thickness of those jams and get an idea of what, what kind of material you're dealing with there. Um, if you have a, a drop ceiling, maybe there's an area where you can push up one of the ceiling tiles to access the roofing material or find some way that you can identify this but you don't want to do any kind of damage to those ceiling tiles or anything so you have to definitely be careful with with that if you if you go to that step of pushing up on a ceiling tile but ideally you should be able to just ask the insured uh, what kind of construction they have if they know now most of these people are not involved in the construction industry at all so they they may not understand what their construction is. They may have just, they, they paid somebody to build it or they may have bought it already built and so they don't know how it's built. So the, the insured may not know and that's fine. Uh, you can always make your best guesstimate based on the age, the, t the other air, uh, buildings around it, uh, just the occupancy. You can look at these different factors and try to make your best estimate. But if you are guessing at the class construction, we wanna make sure that you're identifying that in your report saying that we were unable to ver visually verify based on you know the age and occupancy we think that it's class four. Uh, but you do wanna make sure that it's clear that you did not visually see that uh, to verify that. And if it's something where you just really don't know, it could be it could be a class two, it could be a class four, I really have no idea. We're, we're gonna err on the side of caution and we're gonna go with that lower class construction. So if I, I can tell that the walls are masonry, but I just have no idea what the roof is. I can't make a, a good guess and the insured has no clue. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and in my report say that we could not visually verify the class construction because we couldn't see the roof joist. We're gonna call it a class two for our report, but it could possibly be a class four. Just make sure that it's clear that it was un, undetermined. But for our purposes, for our, we're gonna protect our client and we're gonna go with the air, air on the side of caution with that lower class construction. Because if we say that it's a class two and they have a fire and it turns out it was actually a class four, so the building didn't burn as readily as they thought, well, the insurance company was covered. They had more coverage than they needed. But if we were to go the other way, we were to say, oh, it's a class four, the insurance company writes the coverage based on a class four, there's a fire, oh, it's actually a class two and it spreads rapidly throughout that roof and the collapse and there's a big loss. Well, they didn't. They were not covered then. They didn't have enough uh, coverage 
applied to that. So they're now not happy with us at all because it's costing them a lot of money. So if you cannot tell, then err on the side of caution. But always make it clear whether you saw the materials or if you didn't see the materials so we know uh, if this is a guess or if it's not. Now, class five and class six, where you really almost need to be a structural engineer to truly identify these, because now we're not just looking at the materials being used, but we're actually looking at the burn rating of those materials. So with a class five or the modified fire resistant, what we're looking for is a building that has a burn rating of at least one hour, but less than two hours. So basically what happens is every single structure, every, every building material that you have, if you put it to a hot enough fire for long enough, it will fail. We wanna know how long will this material last in the fire before that failure. So your standard uh, everyday steel, unprotected steel, cannot last for an hour in a fire. It will fail before that one hour mark. So to get a building that will last for at least one hour, we need to have some sort of protection on that steel. So for a class five structure, our walls will be made of either masonry or some sort of steel that has been covered with a fire retardant. And then the roof is probably going to also be a steel that has been covered with a fire retardant. So a fire retardant is just some sort of chemical coverage on that uh, coating on that steel that's going to allow it to burn for longer than that one hour. So it's still not going to last the full two hours, but it's going to give it a little bit longer life. Now, we need to make sure that all of the structural steel in this building has been coated with that fire retardant. As soon as we see a single piece of unprotected structural steel, then that drops this down to either a class three or class four. Uh, we cannot have any unprotected steel inside of that structure. So the walls are probably going to be a masonry, but then that ceiling or that roof is going to be steel that has that fire ret retardant coating on. Most of the time that fire retardant is like a sprayed on, usually like a white foamy fluffy stuff. Uh, it could be applied in other ways, but most of the time it's sprayed on. Uh, best example is like if you go into like a Home Depot or Lowe's or Menards or one of those big kind of factory style stores, you look up at the, the ceiling above you and usually you can see the steel bar joists or steel beams, but they usually have that that fluff on them uh, and that fluff is doing two things one it's a heating and cooling insulin to help maintain the temperature within the structure but two it's a fire retardant so if there's a fire in the structure it has to burn through that fire uh, retardant before it melts the steel and collapses the steel so it just gives it a little bit longer life inside of that fire here we can just see an example of somebody that put that retardant on the entire inside of their structure. So they wanted to make sure all the components were covered. They were actually using this to uh, kind of like a kiln to dry uh, lumber. So that's why they were being extra cautious and putting the fire retardant on the entire interior of the surface. So then we get to the class six, which is our last class. This is our least combustible structure. So this is where we're looking at uh, class six called fire resistance. And for a fire resistant building, we need to have a fire uh, rating of greater than two hours. So the only way possible to, to have steel last for two hours inside of a fire is if it's encased in concrete. So for a class six fire resistive structure, our walls are made of some sort of masonry material or steel that has been encased in concrete. And the roof is made of some sort of masonry material or steel that has been encased in concrete. So this is really gonna be kind of that bomb shelter type of structure. So all of the components are going to be uh, masonry. So typically you're going to see a lot of concrete or poured concrete for this type of structure. Uh, but both the walls and the, <coughs> the roof are going to be this masonry or steel that has been encased in masonry. A common product that we see for this is something called Flexicore. So you see this a lot of times in like hotels or uh, high rise type of apartment buildings. So for the floors, in between each floor and for the, the roof, you're going to see this material called Flexicore. And Flexicore is a concrete material, uh, comes in these panels, and basically it's a, a concrete with a hollow steel tube running through the middle. So on this one down here where it's being constructed, you can see those concrete panels and you can see the hollow tubes that run through the, the middle of that. 
those steel tubes do a couple of couple of things for them. One, it reduces the overall weight of that panel uh, by reducing the amount of, of concrete that's involved. And two, it adds uh, extra rigidity. So it allows it to hold a greater weight and, and to go across greater spans of distance. So it, it just adds the, the rigidity to that panel. So typically what you'll see is you'll see this used as a roofing or as a flooring between floors. And uh, it's just these concrete panels that kind of push together to form a, a floor. So when we're looking at like this hotel room here, you look up the ceiling and you see, oh, there's those grooves there where those concrete panels are coming together. That's telling you right there that that's that flexicore type of system. So that's what you would be looking for on that. And again, it's typically going to be in one of those more uh, high rise or multi-level habitational type of structures. So you might see in something like this or a high rise uh, apartment or condo type of structure. So every floor in this building is going to be that flexicore. The walls are masonry. The walls between each apartment unit are going to be concrete blocks. So they're really trying to uh, control and limit their exposure here. So if they have a fire in a unit, it should be well contained to that unit. And give them a lot of time to get the other people out of the building and then also just limit the amount of damage that they do to the total overall structure. We don't see these very this class construction very often. Mostly we see this in our more urban areas where you have lots of people right on top of each other. Or we will also see this a lot of times in our coastal regions. So, you know, like Miami, Florida, where you have high potential for hurricanes, uh, that's a good time to see a lot of these class sixes because not only does a uh, class six hold up well to fire, it also holds up really well to hurricanes and to wind forces. So those are the times that we were more likely to see the class sixes in those uh, urban areas with a high rise situation or in a coastal region that has hurricane potential. But those are the six classes of construction. Uh, I do wanna show you one other thing here before we move on from the class construction. So if you go to WebInspect and you open up the library, and scroll down towards the bottom. We have a section here called resource materials. There is an item in here called the ISO classic construction matrix. If I open this up, it actually, it'll open up a PDF here and this is a matrix that was designed. So if you look on the left-hand side, it's got a bunch of different wall materials. So you find your wall material. And then across the top, it's got a bunch of different roof materials. So you find your roof. So I find my wall and my roof and where those intersect, it tells me a number and that number is the class construction. If I scroll to page two of this document, uh, I'll see, okay, there's the definitions of the six classes of construction. So this is just a little cheat sheet to help you like uh, as you're actually looking at that structure to help you to identify what class construction is. So this is something, you know, especially when you're new and, and trying to figure this out, you might want to print this off and kind of keep it in your car so that as, as you're actually there looking at the structure, you can reference this and figure out what class of construction that you're dealing with. But that is the, the ISO construction class. Again, class one is the most combustible, class six is the least combustible. And you have to you know try and figure out based on the materials what one year doing that. Now, one of the next questions that we have on the B, the MS, MPS, the multi peril survey, is going to be the number of fire dimensions. Now, this is a question that a lot of our inspectors don't understand and will end up mismarking. We'll see a lot of people put zero there because when they see fire divisions, they're actually thinking about fire walls. And that's not what we're asking. We're asking for fire divisions. So, fire wall is when you have a block put into the, the structure. So there's a wall that separates this, this structure into multiple sections. And so this is a, uh, a solid masonry wall with a one hour fire rating, and it should not have any kind of uh, pass through. So there should not be any heating duct works or the pipes or anything like that going through that wall. Uh, nothing that will connect the two sections of the structure. We should also see if this is a combustible construction, then that firewall should actually extend 
out beyond the exterior walls and up above the combustible roof. So you should have an 18 inch parapet through the outside walls and through the, the roof system if it is a true firewall separating this into multiple fire divisions. So every single building, just by being a building, having four walls and a roof is going to be one fire division. That's just every single structure is at least one fire division. So you should never have a zero for that question. Now, as soon as you insert a fire wall into that building, you have now split that one fire division into two fire divisions. If you put a second fire wall in, you've now split it into three fire divisions. So when we look at that question, we're looking at the number of divisions, not the number of fire walls. So a fire wall is important to identify because it's gonna tell you how many divisions there are, but uh, the question is actually about divisions, not fire walls. Some other important factors to the uh, property or to the premises is going to be the roof and the roof condition. The roof is the most vulnerable part of the structure. It's exposed to the most weather. Uh, it's uh, the highest potentially potential point for water intrusion. So we really want to make sure that that roof is in good condition. So for all, almost all of our inspections, we're looking for some sort of photo of that roof as best you can. So obviously, uh, we're not going to get on any ladders. We're not going to climb up onto the roof. So this is what you can see uh, if you have a camera pole, maybe, or you can take a photo from the ground uh, and zoomed in on that, that roof. We want to get a photo of those roofs whenever possible. Uh, and we get a lot of these that are flat roofs, multiple stories, or just you know 20 feet up or something like that, where we just can't get photos of it. That, that's fine. We don't expect you to climb up on there. We don't expect you to have a drone or anything like that. So if possible, take a photo of the roof. And ideally multiple photos of the roof, you know, showing each surface of that roof because they may, they may weather differently. We're gonna go through a few of the, the more common uh, deficiencies or hazards that we see with the roof, just to make sure that you know what you're looking at there. So this first one that we see is blistering. And blistering just means that there's moisture inside of those shingles. So there's little, little bubbles that are popping up. That means that there's moisture inside of that that means that the, the shingle is starting to fail and that water can actually penetrate through to the, the roof behind it or to the structure behind it at some point. Also, uh, if you have water inside of those shingles, the weather changes, it freezes, is that, that moisture inside is going to expand and it's actually gonna to start to rip apart that shingle. So if we see this blistering, that means that there's already damage to, to the shingle and that that damage is going to actually uh, exponentially get worse it's going to get worse a lot faster because now it's inside of the, the shingle itself cracking splitting and tearing this one's pretty obvious if you see that there's cracks or tears in the shingles that means that they're failing that there's now a new point of water penetration where uh you know we we need to get these replaced cupping is a, a form of uh, aging for an asphalt shingle roof. So as a, this shingle starts to age, it starts to actually kind of shrink and start to pull in on itself. So the first step would be actually curling, where you see the corners or the edges of the shingle start to curl up. Then as it continues to age, it will actually start to turn the other way and it'll start to go under. And it'll, it'll start to form this cupping here where you see that it's actually pushing uh, the edges are pushing down and kind of lifting the shingle up. So you're allowing extra potential for wind damage or uh, these might start to get brittle. So if you have anything falling on it, like heavy snows or hail or anything that it can cause these brittle edges to snap off and break. So this is a pretty advanced aging of a, an asphalt shingle. If you see cupping like this, that means that it's at the end of its useful life and it should be replaced. So curling's the, the earlier stage of that, so where it starts to just lift the little edges up. Um, this means that it's not quite at its final, uh, at the end of its life, but it's definitely uh, aging and will need to be replaced relatively soon. The biggest problem we have with curling is that it actually makes it, uh, gives it a catch for wind. So if you have a high wind, now that wind has something to grab a hold of and it will actually can rip up on those those shingles and cause a lot more damage than it would if it was just laying flat. 
we need to make sure that we're looking at all of the flashing, all of the anything that where there's something penetrating through that shingle roof, well, it, it needs to be protected to make sure that there's no water intrusion going in. So here, somehow they removed the flashing or maybe it just got damaged and fell off, I don't know. But now there's a big open spot where water can penetrate into that roof and cause damage on the inside of the structure. Sometimes with uh, single roofs, they will actually layer them up rather than taking the time and expense of removing the old single roof, you'll just add another layer on top of that. Now, most building codes will say that you can do two layers, uh, but anything more than two layers is going to be uh, considered excessive and uh, will actually cause a lot of problems. One, it's gonna create more weight than what that roof was designed to handle. Um, it, it, you know, it was built with a certain weight in, in mind, and now you're adding more weight and more weight and more weight every time you add a layer to that. Two, uh, it reduces the effectiveness of the fasteners. So <clears throat> the, the thicker your layers of asphalt shingle, the, the less of the nail that's actually penetrating wood and holding that, that shingle in place. So the, the fasteners are less effective the thicker those layers are. And then uh, it just, it's hard to get a nice flat roof when you have uh, multiple layers because you're going to have some kind of bumps and, and things where now you're having potential for wind catching on and ripping those up and so on. So it's just the excessive layers is potentially a problem. Most insurance companies will say that they only want the one layer. Even though the building codes will, uh, will allow two layers, most insurance companies will say they just want the one layer. If you're going to replace it, rip the old one off, put a new one on. <clears throat> so if you're looking at the edges and you see this real thick like this with multiple layers, that'd be something to identify and alert the underwriter of. Anytime you see excessive sealant where they've just gone crazy and they're putting sealant everywhere, this is showing that they had a leak somewhere and they're trying to figure out where it is and they're trying to stop that leak. So they, they're just slapping that sealant wherever they can possibly find to hopefully prevent that water penetration. So rather than you know doing a complete rip off and, and replacing this with proper ripping system, they're just slapping this, uh, basically a Band-Aid on top of it, trying to protect. If you see the exposed felt, that means there's missing shingles. That means that you know, that felt is meant to be an underling. It's not meant to be the final protection for that roofing system. So if you see the, the felt, that's a problem. Uh, fastener problems, if they have the wrong type of fastener or wrong type of nail, if they put the nail in the wrong spot, they don't use enough nails, these are all issues that can cause uh, the, the roof to fail. Uh, so like with these asphalt shingle roofs, they're supposed to be putting those nails uh, in the tar line so that it's below the shingle above it and sealed up by that tar. If they you know, put the the nail too low or too high, then it's going to reduce the effectiveness of that and it could actually potentially add for a water penetration point. So we need to make sure that they're putting it in the right spot and that they're putting enough of them to secure that and hold it in place. You know, with this slate roof over here, uh, sometimes what we see is actually the, the slate material will hold up for 50 plus years. You know, it, it's very durable, it's not going to wear away. but what will happen is sometimes the fasteners, the, the, the things that are holding those uh, slate shingles in place will actually fail. They'll actually rust out and they'll, they'll corrode or whatever. And so then they can't hold the weight of the, the slate shingles. And so now you'll see that the shingles start to slide off because the fasteners fail. Granule loss is the single most common deficiency that we see in a mass wash shingle roof. Uh, most houses that you go to, you'll see some evidence of uh, granule loss. So with these asphalt shingle, shingles, you see that they have that kind of tar, the asphalt material, then they have that crushed rock that's kind of smashed into the surface of it. That, that's going to help protect the, the actual sh asphalt shingle. Uh, you know, the asphalt shingle is what's causing the water, uh, protecting it from water penetration, but those crushed rocks on the top are protecting it from things bumping into it and damaging the, the asphalt shingle. It's also uh, reflecting heat. 
so if the sun's beating down on it, it reflects the heat and protects the asphalt shingle. So what happens though is over time with rain and snow and all this, some of those crushed rocks will actually get washed away and worn away. And so you see this kind of change in color pattern here where you see where the, some of those uh, granules are missing. Uh, in some areas it's brighter white, sometimes some of darker, you know, it depends on you know, how many granules are still left on that shingle. So this is usually the, uh, just a, a sign of standard aging. This is something you would expect. It doesn't mean that it's failing yet. It doesn't mean that you need to replace it yet. This is showing that, hey, this is aging. Uh, as this continues to go, the aging speeds up because as there's more and more of that asphalt underneath that's exposed to the sun, it's gonna, it's gonna heat up and, and cool down faster. It's going to expand and contract more. So it's gonna cause it to age faster the more of it that's exposed. So uh, just know that this is not something that needs to be replaced, but this is something that will begin to age faster and faster as more and more of this granule is lost. Hail damage, uh, this is one that it's typically hard to see unless you're actually up there on it with it or using a camera pole to get a real close up where you can see the little pock marks where the hail hit. Uh, this is something that you know, we would want them to get replaced right away because those hail, that hail is actually causing damage to all that, those shingles, uh, causing potential water penetration points in each one of those shingles, causing those shingles to fail faster. Ice damming is something that we see in all of our kind of nor northern regions where we get a lot of uh, snow and, and ice and real cold temperatures. Uh, what we want to see with a roof system in a northern climate is we want to actually see the snow on top of the entire roof. That means that they have a, like a cold attic system where they're allowing for air to get up into the attic and keeping the attic at a cold temperature. And so then the snow on the roof stays on the roof until the weather's warm enough to melt it off. What we do, what we, what we end up seeing though, is a lot of times we'll get something like this where you'll see above the actual living areas, you can see the roof, but then on the edges, you see the snow and the ice building up. So what happens is they don't have it insulated well, and so the heat from the building comes up and it actually melts the snow off of the roof above the, the living area. And then as it's draining off the roof, it hits these edges here where you have you know, a soffit or eaves here and it refreezes. And so now you have this ice buildup, this what they call an ice dam at the at the uh, soffits or at the gutters. And it's actually, as that freezes, it kind of backs upward up the roof and it can actually get up underneath those shingles and can tear those shingles up and can get underneath them and cause water penetration on, into the structure. So we don't want to see just the edges with ice like this. It can cause a lot of damage to that structure. And it really builds up on these edges here. So we want to, we would rather see snow across the entire roof structure, not just on the edges. Trees can cause a lot of damage to a roof. Uh, so when we're looking at the structure, we want to see, are there any kind of trees around it that are going to be causing potential damage to this structure? Are they actually touching the roof where they're going to be scraping it puncturing it, damaging it, or are they uh, far enough away where they're not touching it? Are they close enough that, you know, in a windstorm they could bend and, and touch it? Or uh, is there heavy uh, dead limbs hanging over the, the roof that could potentially uh, fall off and fall onto the roof and damage the roof? Well, so we really want to look at that and see where the trees are in relation to the structure. Can they touch it? Can they damage it, uh, and so on? So we we will quite often make recommendations to have the trees around the structure trimmed back so that they're not touching or not damaging the structure. This one's a pretty obvious underlayment issue. Anytime you see that kind of wave to the roof, uh, that's telling you that the 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 decking underneath it that's holding those asphalt shingles up is failing. We should not be able to see the individual uh, trusses here. We should just see a flat surface because there should be a wood decking that goes across all of those trusses and then the, the asphalt shingles should be attached to the wood decking. So when we see this kind of sagging here, that's showing us that the, 
wood decking beneath has failed. And now those shingles are just kind of hanging from the different trusses. So that's putting a lot of stress and strain on those. And there's going to be a lot of damage to those shingles and they're going to have potential water penetration and so on. So this would be one where they'd have to actually rip up all of that, those shingles, and then replace all of the decking underneath before they put a new shingle roof on. When we're looking at these roofs, if we can see the kind of vents or the vent covers, sometimes it's easier to see damage to the vent covers on the metal than it is to see it on the shingles themselves. So just make sure that they're they're in good condition, that they're uh, protecting the that the covers are in place to protect the vents themselves and, and so on, to keep water from getting into that vent. And this one is damaged and kind of falling off. So obviously now it's not doing what it's supposed to. You got water penetration through here. And this one looks like it is rusting and starting to, to fall apart here. Uh, so again, we just want to make sure that we're protecting any water penetration. So if they have a cover on it, we want to make sure that cover's in good working condition. Any signs of wind damage? So obviously this one's got damage where the shingles are missing and exposed the felt underneath. But even those shingles over here that are not missing have been damaged by that wind. They've been loosened, they've been lifted. So we would need this entire roof replaced, not just you know kind of patched up. Then any kind of other miscellaneous damages that we see or, or things that are weird. Uh, here, you know, there's obviously some sort of leak that they just put some tar paper over and tacked it down. So this is not a permanent solution to that problem. Uh, it's something that they would need to have a roofer come out here and, and fix that and replace that. Kind of debris on the roof, especially when it's getting into these valleys where the water is going to be gathering, uh, it's going to cause that water to back up and potentially go backwards up against the grain of the, the shingles and up underneath the shingles. So we want to get all that off of the roof so that the water can flow properly the way it was designed. Damaged or missing gutters, we want the water to be able to flow off of the roof and be dispersed away from the, the foundation of the structure. So uh, we want to see these damaged or missing gutters replaced. We have the shingles that are overhanging and sagging. So they should have been properly trimmed as well. So there's a lot of, of issues with this particular roof. Extremely old shingles here that are crumbling and falling apart. We got lots of kind of debris from the shingles that's in the valley here, so it's not gonna flow properly. So this is just way past its life expectancy and should be replaced. Amateur patching of a roof, you can see that they removed a chimney or a vent or something of some sort and then just tried to kind of shingle over it. So now you have this uneven kind of ragged looking system here. Look on the edge, you see that they didn't trim the, set, the edges properly. So you got kind of a jagged edge here, you got some weird spacing throughout. So this is just improperly done. And so it's gonna have potential for water penetration and failure a lot faster than it, it should. It is important that when you're looking at roofs, you look at all surfaces because they are going to age differently depending on their exposure. So this was actually on the same, these two pictures were on the same building, uh, but one of them was on a side facing away from the sun, uh, had extra protection, like uh, I think there was a tree that was blocking part of it. So it was protected pretty well from the weather, whereas the other side was directly into the sun and wind and rain and all that. So it, it weathered and aged really bad whereas this side was still in good condition but these are on the same roof so you know don't just look at one surface and say oh the roof's good you need to make sure you're looking at all of the exposures so again the roof is the the most vulnerable part of a structure so we will we want to make sure we're taking a look at that make sure that this structure is protected from potential water penetration because water can be extremely damaging to a structure so the last thing we're going to talk about today is the common hazards. And common hazards is really just a generic term for uh, the utilities. So the heating, electric, and plumbing. So when we're talking about the heating, we're really, we're talking about a heat source, so a potential cause of a fire. So something that could ignite a fire. 
So we're always looking at a clearance from all of these heat sources from movable combustibles. So this is one of the more common recommendations that we'll have for a heating system is to have the movable combustibles moved away from it. This could be a furnace, this could be a boiler, this could be a water heater, whatever's got that heat source, we wanna make sure that there's no combustibles pushed right up next to it that could potentially ignite uh, and, and start a fire. So here we have, uh, on the left-hand side, we have a furnace with uh, some bookshelves with a bunch of papers and things on it, well within the 36 inches of that, that furnace there. So we wanna make sure that those were getting moved on the right hand side, we see that we have some wooden shutters that have been pushed right up against it. You can even see here's the vent where it's releasing the excess heat off of that, that system. So this is well within the 36 inches. So for our, our heat sources, we wanna see a 36 inch clearance of all movable combustibles. Now, depending on the manufacturer, the design, all that, how well they insulate that system, they may be, uh, like a low clearance type of, of system where they designed it so that it can handle shorter distances. But without the manufacturer specifications showing us that, hey, this is a, a low clearance or a zero clearance furnace, we're just gonna go with our industry, industry standard of 36 inches. With some of our heating systems, they may be gas systems. And for most of our gas systems, we're gonna have that iron piping or that, that black metal piping uh, that you see throughout the, the structure for the gas system. But there is a system called the CSST, which is a corrugated stainless steel tubing system. And this is a, a flexible piping system for gas lines. And so this is something where they would have like the entire building gas lines would be this steel tubing. So it's got that corrugated steel tubing that's bendable and flexible, but then it's coated with this uh, plastic, yellow plastic coating on the outside of it. So this is something that you would see throughout the structure for the gas lines, rather in place of those metal piping that you would normally see. What we're not talking about, this is not the gas connector, that kind of generic uh, plastic line that you see from like, the gas system to your uh, gas stove or your gas dryer. You know, those are just connectors. Those are disposable uh, pipes that can connect the sis gas system to the appliance that's using it. So those are different from CSST. So don't think, don't just see that yellow tubing coming off of the dryer and say, oh, hey, they have CSST. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the entire, uh, the entire system of, of piping for the, that is the CSST. The problem with this is we need to make sure that that piping is actually grounded. So you know, we need to have some way of connecting this piping to the ground so that the electrical charge will be dispersed into the ground. We don't have any kind of buildup where it could potentially arc. Because if you get a little arc of electric, electricity, it could actually puncture a hole into this gas line and now you have gas leaking out into your, your building. So we do not want to see that. So if we ever see that they have the corrugated stainless steel tubing, then we need to make sure that it has been grounded. Wiring is a big cause of fire within structures. So we spend a lot of time going over wiring and the different types of wiring and identifying the wiring. So there's four basic types of wiring that we could come across. There's conduit, armor cable, which depending on where you live, what industry you're working in, you may also hear it referred to as BX or Greenfield, uh, but those are all the same things, just different terms for it. Then there's non-metallic non sheath cable, which more commonly is known as Romex. And then finally, there's the knob and tube wiring. So we're gonna quickly go through some of the pros and cons of each of these and talk about what they are. So the conduit wiring, this is probably the most secure, the safest form of wiring that we see. Uh, it's also the most expensive type of wiring that we see. Uh, this is where you actually have a rigid metal tube surrounding your electrical wire. So anywhere in your building that you want your wiring to go, you have to then run these metal tubes throughout your structure and then the wires actually go through those metal tubes. So the 
positive or the, the the pros of this will it provides a lot of support to your wiring so you don't have your wires kind of sagging or flopping around you know wherever you put that rigid metal pipe that's where that wire is going to go and that's where it's going to stay it's not going to move around it's not going to adjust it's going to be protected if you bump it hit it that steel tube is going to protect the wires on the inside of it it's also going to contain any kind of electrical arcing or sparking or uh, potential fire so it, this is the the safest form of electrical wiring from a fire standpoint this is why we see this most commonly in your larger urban areas. For example, we're here in the, the western suburbs of Chicago. So for the entire uh, Chicagoland area, so we have our building code requires that all buildings in the Chicagoland area, even our residential homes, have conduit wiring. And that's because back in the 1890s, we had a fire that wiped out a huge portion of Chicago. And so we said, oh, that was really bad. We need to make sure that we don't have this ever happen again. So we put in kind of a lot of extra protections and rules about our building construction and how things are built here so that we can prevent these fires because all of our buildings are so close to each other and on top of each other that if we have a fire, it spreads rapidly. So that's why uh, they put into our building code that we have conduit wiring to prevent those electrical fires and to keep it from spreading and, and causing massive damage. Now you go to your more rural areas or your smaller towns where you're not as uh, close to each other, you're not on top of each other. Now if there's a fire, it's usually just that one structure that burns. And so they're not as concerned about that. So they can go with a little cheaper version of wiring. So you might have things like the Romex wiring where it's a much easier wiring, it's a much cheaper wiring, but it's, it works just as well, it's just not as uh, safe from the fire standpoint. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, and with the conduit, you should be able to see those steel tubes going out uh, across the building. Uh, wherever there's electrical, there goes those steel tubes. I, I always look at the actual electrical panel because that's where you can usually see the, the wiring coming out of the electrical panel. Easiest place to identify. If you go into like the main, uh, office area or something like that, then they probably have, you know, drywall up where you can't see the actual wiring. All you see is the the outlets or the switches. You don't see the actual wiring itself. So the best place to identify it is at the actual uh, service panel here. The next level that we have here is the armored cable. So this is uh, still going to be a, a closed system where, you know, if there's an arc or a spark, it's going to be contained with inside this metal tubing. But now it's not a solid rigid tube. Now it's just like a, a metal plating that has been spiraled around the, the wiring. So it can actually bend and flex. Uh, so potential problems with this is that if you bend it too far, those kind of steel plates might actually slide across each other and actually might start to rub on the wires inside of, of that tubing and could actually cause damage to the wiring inside. Uh, this is something that is meant to be complementary to the conduit system. This is not designed to be an entire electrical system. It wasn't meant to be for all of the wiring within the building to be the BX or armor cable. Originally, the National Electric Code said that it should be limited to six foot spans. Uh, they, in the recent years, have kind of expanded that. Now they, they use the term uh, short runs. Uh, so they, they have allowed for longer distances than six feet, but it's still not meant to be an entire electrical system. Typically, wherever we would see the armored cable is when you have a conduit system and you're trying to connect a device to uh, some piece of machinery or equipment, especially something that is going to vibrate or move. So if you have a rigid metal piping for the conduit and you attach it to uh, a piece of equipment that's vibrating and shaking, well, that vibration is going to constantly wreak havoc on that that connection is going to tear that connection apart and loosen it. So if you have that kind of a system, now you use a, uh, a armor cable, something that can bend and flex with that equipment and connect it to the conduit. You still have a closed system, but now you have the ability to absorb that vibration and, and to maintain the integrity of that connection. So that's where we most often see it is in connection to uh, a piece of equipment where you have a kind of a system connecting to a piece of equipment. 
the single most common type of wiring that we have in the United States is the non-metallic sheath wiring, which is also known as Romex. So there's a couple of different types or, or levels of Romex. Uh, you have the NM, which is a flame and moisture retardant. And you have the NMC, which is a flame, moisture, and corrosion retardant. So that's one you might see for like outdoor uses, like for landscape lighting or gardening, things like that, where uh, you, you have to protect from that, that extra corrosion protection. But with both of them, you're going to have like the wires running through, and they just have like a, a plastic coating around the outside of it. With the NM, you're going to see that you have your wires, you have your plastic coating, and there's usually like a like a some sort of filler, something to give it some substance, like a craft paper or something like that inside there. Whereas with the NMC, it's going to be the solid plastic around it, so it's going to be kind of poured in place around those wires, so they're going to be very uh, rigid and stay right where they've been put. So the NM is going to be a little bit more flexible than the NMC, but the NMC is going to have that extra corrosion protection. With all of the uh, non-metallic seed wiring, it, it does tend to be a little bit sloppier than the conduit uh, because there's no, you don't have that rigid support systems. You know, these wires are just going to kind of flop and flail around. So you, you do tend to see a little bit more of a messy system. It's harder to trace the lines to see where each of those wires is going and what they're feeding. Um, we also see a lot more hazards because of uh, do-it-yourselfers. Those weekend warriors that get out there and try to do their own electrical work. Non-metallic sheet wiring is cheaper and it's easier to work with, so it encourages that uh, amateur to go out there and do it. So we see things like this where uh, we're, first of all, we're missing the cover panel on our the service panel here. So now we're exposed to potential electrical shock or potential fire from you know, dust, dirt, debris getting inside there. We have potential for like rodents to get in there and chew on wires and so on. Um, so we want to see that cover panel put back in place. But the reason the cover panel is not in place is because we had an amateur come in here. They got tired of trying to force the wires in through the slots provided. So they actually brought their wire down and around and in through the front of the panel to the to the next breaker there. So this is a, a very serious problem. Now we cannot put that service panel cover on because the wires are blocking that. So the amateur installation is a huge problem for us. We see a lot of hazards because of that. The last type that we see is the knob and tube wiring. This is, uh, generally speaking, this is one of the more concerning uh, types of wiring. This is a very old system of wiring and most of our insurance companies will have some sort of policy in place where they'll either uh, cancel the policy if they find active not into wiring or they'll put some sort of exclusions in place where they'll cover the structure unless it's uh, damage caused by the not into wiring. So the, this is kind of the original version of, of wiring where you have two wires running parallel to each other so that we have the hot wire and the neutral wire running parallel to each other. Usually there's just a minor kind of insulation around them. It may be uh, a paper or a cloth for maybe a light plastic, but uh, it's usually a, a minimal insulation around the wires, but then you have these two bare wires running next to each other. And they run throughout the, the entire house there. And anytime you needed to secure it to a wall or joist or raft or, or a stud or something like that, you would take these little porcelain knobs and you would attach that to the wall and then the wire would run from knob to knob to knob so that it could secure it in place. That porcelain knob then protects the, the combustible wood from the electrical wire. Then if you needed to run through a joist or, or stud or something like that, you would actually drill a hole and then you put this porcelain tube into that hole and then the wire can run through that porcelain tube. Again, the porcelain protects the combustible wood from the wire. And that's where the, the name knob and tube comes from, is from those porcelain knobs and porcelain tubes. So this is an extremely old type of wiring. And so there's lots of potential problems with this. One, you have these wires exposed throughout the structure where you could potentially damage them, bump them, hit them, cross them, causing arcing or sparking. Um, but also it's just, it's so old that it's easily uh, overpowered so you know they're not designed for the current demands of electrical um, so they they were designed to, to like light one light in that room not to run all of our electrical equipment and
components and you know, our big plasma TVs and computers and all the stuff that we have running off of our electrical now. So it just can't handle the demand that our modern use will put on it. When you're looking at it though, you're gonna see, you'll be able to see the wires and you'll be able to see those porcelain knobs, you'll see the porcelain tubes going through the, the structure. So it's pretty easy to identify. But when you see this, it is extremely important that you figure out whether or not this is actually active knob and tube wiring. Sometimes what happens is they'll, they'll take an old system like this, they'll come in and they don't wanna take the time to go through and remove all of the old wiring. So they'll just disconnect it at the service panel then they'll run new wiring alongside of it or throughout the structure. So the you'll you'll be able to see the knob and tube there, but it's not connected to anything. There's no electricity going through it at all. So it's of no risk to the, the structure at all. So you do want to make sure that it's actually connected and active uh, knob and tube. The, the second most common uh, concern or you know specialty wiring that we see that uh, a lot of our insurance companies and underwriters have a big issue with is aluminum wiring. And aluminum wiring is something that was extremely popular from 1965 to 1973. So anytime you see in the construction industry a change in the materials being used, you have to kind of ask yourself why, what happened, why did they change what they were doing? So if you were to go back to 1965, I think there was some sort of like famine or civil war or something like that going on in South America. So the cost of copper went through the roof. So Americans being resourceful, we said, okay, well, copper is extremely expensive. We have aluminum, which is a very cheap, very easily to uh, obtain. And it's a great conductor of electricity. Let's start using aluminum in our wiring. Well, by 1973, they realized uh, hey, that was a bad idea. Uh, we need to stop the use of aluminum wiring. So after 1973, National Electric Code says, hey, you cannot use aluminum wiring anymore. So anything that was built after 1973, anything that was uh, remodeled or reconstructed or worked on after 1973, uh, they cannot use that aluminum wiring. They have to then replace it with the proper copper wire. So when you're looking at the, the service panel, you see those wires coming out of the service panel, you wanna look at the casing on the wiring. If you have a structure that was built during that time period, 1965 to 1973, look at the, the casing on the wiring and look to see if it says aluminum or not on it. Uh, if it does, then we want to make sure that we're identifying that and uh, alerting the underwriter that hey, they have this high risk of wiring here. Um, if it was a building built after 1973, then you don't need to worry about it. If it was built before 1965, you don't need to worry about it unless it was updated during that, that time period, uh, it's not gonna have aluminum. But if it was built or remodeled during that time period, then we need to check to see as best we can if they have aluminum wiring. Now, if there's no wiring available, no, none of it's exposed, uh, then we just have to identify that it was built during that time, but we, we couldn't visually verify whether they had aluminum wiring or not. So why is it so bad? Well, aluminum is, is a metal that is extremely responsive to, to temperature. So as electricity flows across the surface of it, it heats up. And as it heats up, it expands. As soon as that electrical flow stops, it cools down and it contracts. Well, that constant expansion and contraction of that metal can wreak a havoc on any connection that you have. So if you uh, loosen the connection where it connects to like an outlet or, or a switch or something like that, that, that re, um, loosened connection will increase the resistance, which increases the heat and increases your potential of fire at that, at that connection. Also, aluminum is extremely soft. So if you bend the wire too far, it could, could cause it to crimp. If you bump into it, it could cause it to dent. Those crimps, those dents in the surface of the wiring can actually increase the resistance, which increases the heat and then potentially increases your chance of, of fire. And then finally, uh, aluminum is kind of the bully of the, the wiring or metal playground. It doesn't play well with the other metals. So if you try to connect like aluminum wiring to copper wiring, the two metals don't like each other and they'll actually build up a corrosion between them. And that corrosion will then increase the resistance, which increases the heat and increases your potential for fire. So we wanna, we wanna avoid the aluminum wiring if at all possible. So it's something that if they do have it, uh, you know, you have a higher risk of fire. Uh, here we can see that they actually have 
the corrosion buildup between the, the two metals and it actually melted off the wire nut and charred the inside of the, the junction box here. So this is something where it looks like they were able to catch it, but it did definitely cause damage and, and started a, a, at least a small fire within the box there. If this one luckily was inside of a metal junction box, if it was inside a plastic junction box or not in a junction box, then it could easily catch the, the building materials around it on fire. If they have aluminum wiring, it doesn't mean that they're out of luck. It doesn't mean that they have to necessarily replace all of the wiring in their structure. There are ways to operate aluminum wiring safely. Uh, it's just a little bit kind of cost prohibitive. Because uh, now you're going to have to do something kind of like a thermography where you're going to have to use a heat sensitive camera to examine all of the wiring and outlets and switches and throughout your structure to look for potential heat spots. So here we're looking at a picture through a thermography camera of the service panel itself. So you can see there's three lines coming in here. So this one's blue. That means it's nice and cool. There's probably not any electricity flowing. This one's green, so there's definitely electricity flowing, but it's flowing properly, so it's staying cool. This one here at this one little connection is starting to turn red. Uh, so it's starting to get hot in this spot. That means that this connection here is probably loose. So now that we've identified that, the electrician can go in there, they can tighten that connection down, and you'll see that dissipate back down into the green again. So you know there are ways to kind of protect and identify uh, these potential problems before they actually turn into fires. It's just, again, it's costly. And so they have to, they have to be proactive and, and protect that. So most of our clients, they don't want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with the expense. So they'll just either completely cancel if they see aluminum wiring, or they will put some kind of exclusion in place saying, hey, we're not going to cover any damages caused by aluminum wiring. But the single biggest issue that we see with our, all of our electrical is going to be that do-it-yourself, where they have the improper installation or improper use of the wiring. So the one on the left here, you see we have a junction box. This is a nice conduit system, so it's a closed system, but there's no cover plate on this junction box. Because, so now we have dust, dirt, debris getting up inside of that, that closed system. Uh, potentially a mouse could get up in there, et cetera. Uh, but the reason that they don't have a cover plate on here is because they don't have the ability. There's too many wires. Uh, so they have too many connections inside of this one junction box, and the, the wires that they have in there are way too long. So this is suggesting that an amateur did this. They put too many junctions in one box, and they left way too much waste wire on here. You know, a, a professional electrician is just going to leave themselves enough wire to make the connection and shove it back into the box. You know, this one's got like a two-foot wire hanging down from that box is not what you would want to see. The one on the right, this is this is a crazy one. This was down in Atlanta, Georgia, at a bar where they had uh, a lot of electrical demand in this one section of the, the structure where they had like their uh, DJ booth, they had a smoke machine, the fog machine, or the foam machine, they had laser lights, they had all these different things in this one area. And they didn't have, as an old structure, didn't have enough electrical supply for what they were trying to do. So they started basically shipping electricity into the area with all of these extension cords. So they were plugging the extension cord into another area and then running that cord into this, uh, to the area that they needed the electrical from. Well, they started to run out of uh, cords that were long enough, so they started to, to rig them up here. So here we actually see they took the male prongs of this cord here, and then they just directly wired them to the, the this wire to the male prongs, and then put a little electrical tape around it to try and secure it. So we don't want to see temporary wiring, and we definitely don't want to see this kind of rigged up, kind of unsafe way of, of connecting those. And then finally, uh, we have some. These are relatively new concerns that have popped up over the last couple of years where we see more and more insurance companies are writing exclusions or canceling for these uh, older uh, kind of problematic types of circuit breaker systems. You know, normally we, we want to see a circuit breaker. This is the ideal is to see a circuit breaker. We don't want to see fuses as the protection. We want to see circuit breakers. But there are a couple of brands that have been known to fail and cause 
uh, a higher risk of, of fire. And the, the first one, the primary one that we see here is the FPE stab lock. So FPE is, is the um, Federal Pacific Electric is the company. Uh, and then the stab lock is the actual brand or style of, of breaker that they have. Usually it's really easy to identify because it's, it's usually got those little red tips on the end of the breakers, but they're usually spread apart and the, the, the section goes down the middle of it in the white lettering that tells you, you know, the different breaker numbers and, and things, but it says right at the top stab lock. Anytime we see the FPE stab lock breaker, we want to take a photo of that breaker and we want to make sure we're making a wreck to have the electrician come out here and replace it with a more modern version. These breakers have been known to stick. So even if there's an overage, it's not going to trip the way that it was designed to. Uh, so it, it causes a lot higher potential of fire. The second one that we see here, these are the pushmatic. So when we see that uh, most of the time the breakers are kind of that switch where they flip back and forth, these are pushed ones where they push in or, or pop out. Uh, those have been known to also stick and not pop out when uh, there's an overage. And so then they have this, this potential, higher potential for fire. So if we see these pushmatic style, uh, we also want to take a photo of that and, and then uh, make a recommendation to have it inspected by an electrician and, pop, um, and replaced with a more modern system. We also see on this one that there's an empty slot here. We want to make sure that all unused openings in any any breaker panel we see, all unused openings should be covered by a, a blank so that we don't have any kind of dust or debris getting inside there and potentially causing fire. So that brings me to the, the end of part one here. So uh, again, we covered our fire protection. We covered the construction of the building itself. We covered uh, the common hazards or the utilities of the structure. So that's really focused primarily on the property coverage today. So Thursday, when we come for part two, we will start to look at the liability coverages. So the slip, trip, fall, bump, the life safety code, uh, portions of this, of this inspection. But then we'll also get into the operational exposures and look at the unique items that come up because of the specific operations that they're performing. So before I end the session here, I'm going to open it up and see if there are any questions. And if you have a question, please go ahead and, and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. If there are no questions, we'll, we'll go ahead and end the session. All right, well, I do appreciate you spending the time with me here this morning. If you have a question, something comes up, you do have my email address. You can always uh, send me an email, ask me your questions, and I will be more than happy to help you out and explain what it is that Midwest Technical Inspections is looking for uh, on these inspections and what you should be looking for and help you with some of those tips and, uh, of the trade here. But otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting. Have a good day.